Welcome to Cokesbury Online. We are so glad that you are joining us from wherever you are tuning in. And we also want you to remember that if you're in the Knoxville area, you can join us in person. And you can do that by going to the Cokesbury app and registering. Those services are on Sunday, 10 a.m., one on the South Campus and one on the North Campus. We hope you can join us. So today, we're going to be continuing our Advent series, The Greatest Story. And Stephen is going to be bringing us the message from Luke 2, where he will share with us how building a foundation for our lives, especially during this season, can make all the difference. And now we're gonna hear from Josh and the band, Here Comes Heaven. Children weep no more. Oh. 
Here at Cokesbury, as you know, we're all about taking next steps. And one way to take a next step is through giving. We just wanna to continue to thank you all so much for the generosity you have shown us in our community all through this year. And we want to remind you that how we can show God's love through giving not only helps our community, but the world and beyond. There are so many ways that you can give. We make it easy if you'd like to give by going to cokesbury.tv. You can also go to the Cokesbury app. You can mail it in, and you can also text to give at the number on the screen. Again, we can't do what we do without you, and the community and our world is better when we come together and give, so thank you. And now we're gonna to continue to worship with the song, Learn to Fly.
done nursing the patients You can wait one night Give it all away if you give me one last try We live happily ever trapped in you Just save my life Run and tell the angels that everything's alright And I'm looking at the sky to save me Looking for a sign Hey, good morning, everybody. I'm Stephen, senior pastor here at Cokesbury, and wherever you're joining us from, I'm really grateful you're taking time out of your schedule to be here. We're in this series, it's our Christmas series, The Greatest Story Ever Told, and it's a fascinating story. If you tuned in last week, um, Anna talked about this idea of a promise coming through the prophet Isaiah to the people of Israel who found themselves in a really bad spot, right? And so Isaiah starts talking about this coming Messiah, this savior of the world who would come and make everything right. The problem is they had to wait 400 years. That's a long time. Like we've been waiting nine months for a vaccine. Imagine waiting 400 years. And yet that promise of a Messiah was the foundation on which the people of Israel were supposed to build their faith. And it got me thinking, What's the bedrock foundation you're counting on? Like, what's that big hope you're waiting on when all of your other little hopes or all of the maybe hopes or all of the situational hopes are gone and they don't pan out? What's the bedrock hope that you're building your life on? Really, if you think about it, there are only two alternatives when you're looking for an ultimate foundation to build your life on. And all I wanna do in this message is lay them both out and kind of tell you where the gospel lands, and I'm gonna invite you to make a decision. So let me ask again. What's the foundation you're going to go into your one and only eternity counting on? We see these two alternatives laid out really clear all over the place in the scriptures. One is in the Old Testament book called the Psalms, and here's what the psalmist says at one point. That no king is saved by the size of his army, no warrior escapes, by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save, but the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love to deliver them from death. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In other words, I build my life on one of two foundations. I can trust in me or I can trust in God. Now, in the first alternative, I choose to depend on my own self-sufficiency, right? 
Like I count on my own gifts or I count on my own strength or it's all about my intelligence or my ability to foresee problems or my ability to actually solve problems. It means I'll save myself by my own works or my own achievements or it's through my own career or my own financial status or maybe my own good deeds or through my own religious practice. It's sort of like a DIY strategy, right? Do it yourself. When our kids were little and it was this time of year, the Christmas season, and we bought them a complicated present, I hated seeing that phrase on the package. You know, typically I would have done like 10 Christmas Eve services, we would have been completely exhausted, would have rushed home and tried to squeeze in a few minutes of Christmas with my family before the kids had to go to bed. And then we get them in bed and then I'd be confronted with that DIY assembly process. One year we had gotten them a particularly complex toy. I think it was like this small nuclear reactor, right? And nothing in it went by the directions that came with it. And so like tab A did not fit into slot B and after hours of frustration and lots of frankly inappropriate language, like one in the morning, I finally would say to Beth, do you need some help with that? It's a funny thing. People who would never try do-it-yourself with their kids' toys or with their car or like a vacuum cleaner or something complicated, they will try it with their own lives, with their ultimate destiny on the line. The writers of Scripture in the ancient world noticed that this do-it-yourself, self-sufficient, I-can-build-my-life-on-me strategy would lead to this strange combination of arrogant hubris on the one hand but then this enormous sense of fragility. I love these words from the book of Job. Though the pride of the godless person reaches to the heavens and his head touches the cloud, that's kind of a striking image. He will perish forever like his own dung. Those who have seen him will say, where is he? Surely he will have no respite from his cravings. He cannot save himself by his treasure. Think about that. Even money can't do that. Now, I want to suggest that this trust in your own strength strategy, that you have enough money, that you're smart enough, that you're bright enough, that you're strong enough, it's stronger than ever in our day, especially in the little area of the world where you and I live. There is a huge pull on this one. There's a guy named David Brooks. He's a brilliant writer, and he teaches at Yale, and one time he gave this lecture And he says the temptation to idolize self-sufficiency and achievement has become sort of the hallmark of the culture in which you and I live. And I don't think it really takes too much effort to look around and get that sense. In fact, I would argue that most of us probably feel that pull every single day. You may be feeling that pull right now as you're engaging with me. But this is what he says. He said, I lived much of my life in the secular culture and it's an achievement-oriented culture. It starts really early and it's kind of crushing our kids. If you go to the elementary schools in my local neighborhood, you see the kids coming out at three in the afternoon. They've got those 80 pound backpacks on. If the wind tips them over, they're like beetles sort of stuck there on the ground. They get picked up from school by creatures I call Uber moms who are highly successful career women who've taken time off to make sure all their kids get into Harvard. During pregnancy, they're taking so many soy-based nutritional formulas that the babies plop out these gigantic 14-pound toothless defensive linemen, just sort of like boom, right? So you can get the image of this. Uber parents, dads, just as maybe even more performance-oriented than moms, cutting the umbilical cord, flashing little Mandarin flashcards at their kids, getting them ready for Harvard. These kids turn into the junior workaholics of America. By the time they've applied to schools, they've started six companies, cured three formerly uh, fatal diseases, and they're playing obscure sports like Frisbee golf. When I ask my students, what are you going to do for spring break? It's like, you know, I'm going to unicycle across Thailand while reading to lepers, that sort of thing. They have tremendous faith in themselves. In 1950, the Gallup organization asked high school seniors, are you a very important person? That's a question that all of us ask. And at that point, he says, 12% said yes. 
They asked the same question in 2005, and 80% said, I am a very important person. Americans score 25th in the world in math, but if you ask Americans, are you really good at math? We are number one at the world, in the world of thinking that we are really good at math. Number one in the world. Time Magazine, he writes, ask Americans, are you in the top 1% of the nation's earners? 19% of Americans believe they're in the top 1% of American earners. So here's what he says. We have a lot of self-confidence. We do it ourselves. And we have a great desire for fame. Fame used to be a quite low as a value. Now, fame is the second most desired quality in young people. They did a study. Would you rather be president of Harvard or Justin Bieber's personal assistant? By three to one margin, people would rather be Justin Bieber's personal assistant than the president of Harvard. Though to be fair, he writes, I asked the president of Harvard and she would rather be Justin Bieber's personal assistant too. It's interesting. So there is this achievement culture that we live in. This entire group of people who are striving and trying to win success. Brooks goes on to express this contrast, this hunger for success by two different sets of virtues. He talks about resume virtues and eulogy virtues. That's a profound distinction. Resume virtues are the things that you bring to the marketplace that you put on your resume, like here's my IQ, or here's my SAT score, or here's all the degrees I've acquired, or here's some of the awards I've won, or, or maybe here's the ladders that I've climbed, or here's my network. You can have a really good resume and yet be a really bad person. You can have a really good resume and you can lead a really bad life. It happens every single day. Eulogy virtues, on the other hand, are the qualities that people talk about when somebody dies. Like what kind of person you actually were. Whether you were loving or maybe joy-filled or you lived your life with a deep sense of humility or maybe your focus was on serving others or maybe you were one of the most generous people that they'd ever met. Now here's the rub. In our secular culture, we all know that eulogy virtues are more important, right? Like, that doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out. And yet, if we're honest with ourselves, most of us are gonna spend the majority of our time trying to build resume virtues. Like, our sense of identity and all of our emotion, it gets wrapped up in those resume virtues. And we wrestle with questions like, who am I and do I matter and does my life actually count? See, the writers of Scripture, they knew all about this. That I can try sort of a do-it-yourself resume salvation. It is possible for human beings, just like you and me. We really can convince ourselves that I can depend on my education or my wealth or my looks or my connections or maybe my achievements, and that will secure my life. I can even throw in some good deeds. I can throw in occasional church attendance or maybe a little giving along the way or, or maybe every once in a while volunteering. But y'all, here's what I know for sure. A crisis is going to come and all of your degrees will not make that crisis go away. Just as surely as you and I are engaging with each other right now, suffering is going to come. And when suffering comes, all of your networks and all of your contacts cannot stop it. The reality is, especially given the culture in which you and I live, for some of us, an addiction will come. And all of your strength will not be able to deliver you. Some of us are gonna face moral failure. It's going to come our way. And all of the doctors in the world cannot wash away the guilt that wakes you up at two o'clock in the morning. For sure, <laughs> as much as we don't like it, aging and death will come. And when death comes, judgment will come. And you and I will stand before a holy and just God one day, and he will not be impressed with your resume or with mine. See, kings and warriors and wealthy folks, the rich and poor discover their armies, their strength, 
their horses, their treasures, their toys, their homes, their 401ks, their titles, their resumes, there is a moment where you realize that cannot save me. But the good news is there's another way. The scriptures say, but the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those who hope in his unfailing love to deliver them from death. We wait in hope for the Lord. That means I can give up trusting in myself. That means I can actually make God my savior. I can claim God as my healer and my rescuer and my deliverer. I can actually be in a legit friendship with the creator of the universe. See, it's the opposite of do-it-yourself salvation. It's, it's this thing called grace. The scriptures say, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can both. See, we're all on common ground. This is why the Bible says, in the fullness of time, God sent his son, Jesus. Which brings me to the Christmas story. We actually see these two ways laid out one more time. In Luke chapter two, the most famous telling of the Christmas story, it starts out with these words. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Now, why should all the world be taxed? It's because Caesar Augustus needed more food for his army. Because Caesar Augustus, who had the greatest resume in the world, who trusted in his own greatness, who was actually called the savior of the whole race of mankind by Roman citizens, he needed more grain for his armies but a king is not saved by the size of his army. Meanwhile, the story tells us that an angel came to some shepherds. How many resume virtues do you think shepherds have? They didn't have any. They were at the bottom of the list. They weren't even considered to be honest because they would often let their flocks just sort of graze on anybody's land. So like boundaries and things like fences and ownership didn't really mean much to shepherds. They weren't even allowed to give legal testimony because they weren't considered respectable. Like no kid in Israel grew up saying, man, I hope one day I get to be a shepherd. Caesar Augustus made a decision that all of the world would be taxed. Angels came to some shepherds and said, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that shall be to all people. Today in the city of David, that's Bethlehem, a savior is born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. His name will be called Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. See, it's that promise that got made 400 years earlier. What the angel is saying is, look, you don't have to be afraid anymore. I know that the world seems like it's filled with chaos, but that promise that you bet the farm on, that promise that for generations you've been building that God is gonna send a savior, today I've got good news. It's happening. For in this little town of Bethlehem, there's a baby born, and he is the savior of the world. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He was born in a little manger, and he lived a perfect life. And on the cross, he died a death that you and I deserve to die so that you and I can live a life that we never deserve to live so that we could actually go through our days having hope that we never really deserve to have. See, friends, that right there, that's grace. The angel said, this is good news. Today, a savior is born. It was almost laughable. This is a poor baby in a little manger that nobody had ever heard of in a world where Caesar Augustus rules. But not a single human being on this planet calls Caesar Augustus savior today. And hundreds of millions of people call Jesus savior. And that number grows every single day, all because of that one life. And so here we are. The second week of Advent, we're being presented with a choice. And it's not a one-time, get-it-done kind of deal. It's a decision that you and I must make at the beginning of each new day. Am I going to live my life under my power or am I gonna live by God's grace? There's a huge difference. 
Will I try and try and try? Will I work hard? Will I drive myself into the ground just trying to eke out some measure of life? Or will I seek another way, a better way, a more fulfilling way to approach each day? See, I've long believed and I've long argued that for the vast majority of us, following in the footsteps of Jesus is difficult, not because we have a lack of information. Like most of us, if we're honest, we know enough about Jesus and about the faith that we proclaim that we know what we're supposed to do and we know how we're supposed to live our lives. The struggle is not a lack of information or knowledge. For most of us, the struggle is actually application. Trying to figure out how do I apply what I already know so that I'm able to take a step forward in my walk with Jesus. And y'all listen, if Christmas teaches us anything, it reminds us that our way is not the best way. And we don't have to wear ourselves out. Christmas reminds us that we don't have to run and run and run. We don't have to live with the weight of the world on our shoulders. You and I can actually step off the treadmill of approval. We can pump the brakes on living only for ourselves. It's a reminder that you and I get to choose every single day. See, what's great about God and his way of life is that as long as there's air being drawn into our lungs, it's never too late. You and I get to re-up every single day. That's what's so amazing about grace. You can't beg for it. You can't borrow it. You can't steal it from somebody else. It's freely given by God, and all we've got to do is accept it. We've got to claim it. We've got to drink it deep into our souls. See, it's Christmas, y'all. This is the time of year when our focus ought to shift away from the resume virtues that so dominate our lives and turn our attention toward those eulogy virtues that actually matter most. It's this season where you and I are called to be more loving. You can do that. You can make the decision right now that you're gonna be a more loving person. It's that time of year when we're called to be filled with compassion. You can be a much more compassionate person. I know you can. This is that season where we're called to be quick to offer forgiveness and quick to ask for forgiveness, to speak words of grace in life, to put aside old grudges and frustrations. And I'm telling you, when you do that, we become a part of the spirit of Christmas that so many people are desperate for because we create more and more space for the spirit of Jesus to work through us. So let me ask the question again. Which foundation are you building your life on? Have you actually placed your trust in Jesus? It's not hard to do, and what's great about being online is it's just you, and it's God. If you haven't placed your trust in Jesus, I wanna invite you to do that today. I think it's the most important decision that you're gonna make. You really can make that decision that, that God, I'm asking you to come into my life. I cannot do this on my own, and I'm, I'm asking you, would you come in and would you begin to rearrange the priorities in my life? Would you begin to show me that there's another way to live? And for those of us who are watching and you're already in a relationship with Jesus, your challenge this Christmas is, why don't you just re-up that relationship? Why don't you just say, God, right now, I know the world's been chaotic and my life maybe hasn't gone the way I thought it would go, but right now I'm re-upping, I'm recommitting to you. I know that you've never gone anywhere, that you've never abandoned me, but I wanna walk closer with you, so would you help me become more loving? Would you give me opportunities where I can share compassion? Would you illuminate those areas in my life where I've messed up so that I can try to make it right again? When I begin to speak to the people that I'm gonna interact with, could you give me words of grace and would you remind me that my job is not to tear down but to build up and would you allow me to speak words of life into the people that I love? And if you're carrying around an old grudge or you've got some frustration or rub in your life, would you just ask that God during this season, would you give me the ability to just give that over to you? I promise you, when you and I do that, when we re-up and we build our lives on the right foundation. That's what leads to success in life. That's what leads to this thing called peace. See, you won't experience peace on earth until you experience peace in you. And neither will I. So much of what makes life worth living 
is being able to walk in the vein in which you were created. And I think from the very beginning, the scriptures make it clear that most of our struggle in life, it doesn't come based on what happens to us. It's the reaction that we have inside of us. And the best way I know to achieve a life well lived is to walk in the path that Jesus laid out. Y'all, it's Christmas. And in just a few short weeks, it's gonna be a brand new year. And what if we use this moment to re-up and say, you know what? For the rest of this year, and as I look forward into a new year, I don't know what's gonna come, and I don't know what's gonna happen, but I'm gonna do everything I can to walk closer to Jesus than ever before. If you'll do that, you'll experience the spirit of Christmas. And more of us will make a difference with our life. And maybe, if we're lucky, the world will have a chance to change. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you have a great week. I can't wait to see you guys next time. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Through